All right, well, maybe we'll get started. Um, we'll see if anyone else joins us. Um, I do recognize a couple names, but um, I was wanted to, sorry, hang on. I think there's like some weird blue jay outside the window. I should close, <laughs> close the window. <laughs> There, it'll be less distracting. Um, <laughs> I wanted to um, start off first with getting a sense of um, where you guys are at in terms of uh, using eBird, atlasing, um, and uh, and I guess birding, birding skills as well. Um, so if you feel comfortable, um, I encourage you to, to just um, to speak up and and let me know um, that way because I'm planning to try to tailor this a bit to to your needs because I um, assumed there would be a small group of us so I'm Angie hi Andy uh, I've been a, a focused birder for the last three years uh, I started using eBird pretty on and I pretty early on and I'm familiar with it uh, but I only vaguely know about the bird atlas part of it and um, would like to know more and participate. Great. Hi, I'm Lynn. Uh, very similar to Angie, I, I've uh, been birding off and on with my parents since I was a kid, but uh, really got more serious about it since basically COVID thing, you know, um, and only just learned about the bird atlas. Uh, one of our local eBird uh, people emailed me and let me know. So I'm eager to learn about it and try, try to help. Great, awesome. Looks like Amelia put something in the chat. And Amelia, I think uh, you've been atlasing. I think I've already been participating to some extent. And Deb, I recognize your name as well. Does anyone else want to introduce themselves or? Zach? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Zach. I'm the regional coordinator for the Capital Region. And I've been birding for about 10 years. Thanks. OK, hi, and Ada. Oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Jane. and. Um, I've, I've done a little atlasing here and there and uh, just thought I might uh, pick up a tip or two on how to do some of these uh, more specific things like uh, confirming grassland species or anything like that. <laughs> uh, okay. Just, just here to kind of get some more information. I, I may have to leave at some point, so it has nothing, no reflection on the program, but <laughs> just to let you know. Okay, great. Um, and Ada put something in the chat that um, she doesn't, she's, she birds, but doesn't know anything about the Atlas. And, and Deb, yeah, I can't hear you, Deb. Um, but yeah, you said you would like to know about um, how to tell what block you're in, in the field. Okay. And I think, Brian, I don't know if you wanted to introduce yourself or not. I just had asked, uh, you started birding a year and a half ago and just started seeing emails about the Atlas in the last month. Great. Wow, so I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that um, we have a nice group of people and um, 
so many of you are, are new to Atlas Inc. So I um, have been birding for about 20 years now. Um, and I've participated for in a couple of atlases in Vermont and Connecticut, um, and now obviously in, in New York. Um, and I've found atlasing to be just my style of birding. Um, it fits me really well. So um, I don't necessarily like to, to go out all day and try to, to take up off as many species as I can, but I like to really learn about the birds and and observe them and, and watch their individual behaviors and and then like go home and do some research and try to understand what it was that I was seeing or, or why why I was seeing it when I was seeing it or where I was seeing it. So um, so I feel like um, Atlasing gives you this really different perspective um, in terms of your birding and your birding skills. Um, it really kind of encourages you to, to take things a step further than just identification um, and, and really learn more about their, their life history. Um, so this is um, actually the second year of the New York Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, this is the third time that New York is doing such a survey. Um, and basically the, the goal of the project is to do a statewide inventory of all the birds breeding across the entire state. Um, and so it's a, it's a massive effort. We've got thousands of people across the state that are participating. Um, and the, the information is, is really critical for, um, for conservation and, and science. Um, the, you know, all of the, the people that are making land management decisions in the state really look to the Breeding Bird Atlas data um, to to know what's going on and, and how their land management practices are affecting things. Um, because it's really the most complete survey we have in the state of any taxonomic group. So, you know, mammals, herps, insects, whatever it is, like birds we know the most about. Um, and so it really gives us this really nice snapshot in time of, of where the birds are and where they're living. Um, and, and now that this is the, the third survey, um, we'll be able to really see how things have changed. So that first survey, the first time they did the Atlas, um, it started in 1980. And then the second one um, started in 2000. And so now we have this one that started in 2020. Um, so we do it every 20 years. And so we'll be able to really see how much um, these distributions of birds have changed over the last 40 years or so. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what kind of changes there, there are. Um, uh, but in order to do that, first we need to get people out there and, and atlasing and, and contributing data. Um, so let me start a little bit with the a little overview. So there's basically three key points for atlasing. One is, is knowing where you are um, in the state. Um, and so what we do is we break the state up into blocks, um, thousands of blocks across the state. And, and that kind of helps us keep the project a little more manageable. Um, and then the, the second thing, the, the core thing is really, um, you know, making those observations of, of the breeding behaviors that you're observing. Um, so different behaviors tell us how likely it is that that species is actually nesting in that location. Um, and then the third thing is um, entering the data, right? So that's the, the last, the key last piece of it is submitting your data to, to the project. Um, so that's going to be a little bit the, the outline of this um, presentation. Um, what does Amelia say? She says she went out last weekend and she was sad to have so many commons missing. No towhees, red shoulder hawks, or great crested flycatchers. Interesting. I think um, this is one thing to, to notice about the phonology. So that's how, you know, the timing of things as they change throughout the season. Um, and depending on where you are in the state, things will be very different. Um, and a lot of the birds sing and are really vocal when they first arrive. 
And then once they're on their nest, they're gonna get really quiet. And then they'll start getting more vocal again once they have young. Um, so depending on where you are, um, it, you, you may have a hard time finding and observing behavior. So um, this, this weekend, just starting this weekend and going into the next couple of weeks, most birds should have a lot of young fledglings that they'll be feeding. Um, so it's, this is a good time to kind of get started in terms of um, getting out and observing behaviors. So, so I'm gonna start, um, I'm gonna share my screen. I did not put together any slides because I really want to show you how to do these things in real time. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and show you um, the Atlas website. So let me go there. Let's see. Just a sec. Deal of you. Okay. Great. So this is um, the home page for the Atlas, and I'm going to put this link in the chat for everyone in case you aren't familiar with it already. Um, so our website is hosted on the eBird platform. That is how we submit data as well as through eBird. Um, so if you're already familiar with eBird, you're going to have no problem. Um, and even if you aren't, it's, it's fairly simple and there's a lot of um, training um, tutorials available for you. Um, so, so from this home page, um, you can find, you'll be able to see your own information. So, you know, how many species you've actually confirmed breeding, how many blocks you've visited, how many checklists you've submitted and so forth. Um, and then right below that, you're going to find all of the Atlas links to some of the major Atlas resources. Um, and then you'll see some news and, and then also some profiles of some other Atlasers. Um, and then you can scroll down and, and get more information about the data that have been submitted recently. Um, so, but what I'm going to do is go to the very top. And because we're talking about blocks, I just want to show you kind of what that looks like across the state. So across the top here, there's several different tabs. You see this a submit button and then explore. And then if you go over a little further, there's about and news. Those are the, th the four things that you'll be using. So let's go to explore first. And this is where the beauty of us using eBird um, means that all of the data that you submit is available for everyone else to see immediately. So we can really track our progress in real time. And that means that you can see what you might be, um, what you might expect to see in every block. And also um, maybe what you don't need to focus on so much if you want to spend your time looking for you know, somebody mentioned they want to know more about grassland birds. Um, you might be able to query and see what blocks don't have any grassland bird observations, and then you could go to those blocks and try to fill in those gaps. Um, so the place I'm going to take you to first here, there's a different things you can go to, but I'm going to take you to this Atlas effort map down here. And so what this does is this shows us the whole state, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And here you can start to see all of the little blocks. These are all the Atlas blocks, this grid that you see here. Um, so there's 5,710 blocks across the entire state. Um, and what we've done, and instead of surveying every single one of those blocks, we've selected a third of those blocks that we call priority blocks. And those are really where we want you to prioritize your effort, um, but you can still survey in any of the blocks and all of the information is, is valuable. Um, so I'm located in Albany, so I'm gonna zoom in to the Albany area. 
Um, let's see, and go a little further. There we go. Um, so you can see here the um, some of the blocks have these thicker outlines around them. Those are the priority blocks. And so whenever you click on any block, um, a little um, overview of the status of that block will show up and it will tell you if it's a priority block on the top or not, the name of the block and how much effort and how many species have been observed there. Um, and then you can also click on this button down here where it says view all block data. And you can see all of the information for that block. So here I'll open that tab up and we can look at that. So for this block, we can look and we can see all of the species that have been documented, what type of evidence they've um, has been documented for them, uh, where it's been observed, the date, and all of that type of information. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to this Atlas effort map and I wanna show you that in the top left of this page, there is a drop down here. Um, so what I tend to do is I will look at um, one of these other options. So let's just look at confirmed species. So this means how many species have been confirmed breeding. And we'll get to a little more what that means in, in a bit. Um, and then I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. All right, so this map you'll see starts to look quite a bit different than the previous map. Um, and there's a lot of areas that don't have uh, many observations in them. And those are the areas where um, it's like a phone ringing or something. Sorry. <laughs> um, those are the areas where um, there's been less effort and where you could, could target your efforts. Um, so that's a little bit about how to observe the blocks, how to see what has been observed in them. Um, and I will get to the question about how to see your location in the field in a, in a bit. But for now, are there any questions about, about blocks in general and how you um, can find information about those blocks? Does what I presented make sense? Yes. I found the tutorial um, that showed how to locate where your blocks are on uh, using eBird was really helpful. Um, but I did want to make sure like, so it's helpful if we just go into a block once, right? Like I was reading the stuff that's talking about, you know, try to get from a fair sampling of places in the block and stuff. But I mean, yeah, you're I mean, not any... always looking for us to do that, right? Yeah, so there's different ways that you can contribute to the project. Um, so, you know, anything, basically any time that you visit one of the blocks, it's helpful, it's contributing information. Um, and so, you know, so, so one option is, yeah, you could just go to different blocks, like for a single visit and, and see how many species you find and if you see any evidence of breeding. Um, another option would be to, to go to a block several times throughout the year, the same block several times throughout the year, because every time you go, you'll see different species um, in different stages of breeding, right? Um, and then another way that you can do it is you can visit different places within a block so that you're hitting different habitat types. So you're getting a nice sampling of the different species in that block. Um, you can do any, any of those strategies. Um, you can even um, just target 
specific habitats or um, if you're uh, a night owl or really into nocturnal birds, you could just be going out at night versus in the day. Um, there are some species that are really active at dawn or dusk, you know, like thinking rails or night jars. Um, and for those, you would you could just go out, you know, in the evening at dusk. Um, so, so it really can be tailored to your personal preference, um, your style of birding. Everything would be is helpful. Okay, so I want to go back to this explore page real quick and I just want to show you there's two other ways to look for information. One is to look for a particular species. So say um, you're interested in the, the grassland birds. Let's just keep going with that example. So one thing that you could do is you could search for bobolink. And then what we'll do is we'll get a map of all the bobolink observations that have been submitted to the project so far. Um, and then this gives you a good sense of where there are grassland birds. There's some grassland habitat available. Um, and if you were to compare this map to say grasshopper sparrow or vesper sparrow, you would see quite a big discrepancy, right? Because one, those other species are not very common. Um, and two, they're a lot harder to observe because bobolinks are so bright and they're like up and about and they're like flying around and they're singing and, and they're just very easy to detect. Um, so you could use this map to guide you and say, I want to go check out some of these grasslands and see if I can get some other species in those blocks um, that might be harder to detect. Um, so that's another way that you can search the data here. Um, and I want to show you another really cool trick. So if you're curious to know what's going on in the entire, you can, you can pick um, a block you can pick a county, you could pick an entire county and see what's been seen, or you can pick the entire state. Um, so over here in the Explore Atlas regions, you can enter New York. Um, and then this will show you an overview for the entire state. Um, kind of shows you a snapshot of where we're at right now, which I find really impressive. So in what month are we? Now we're at the end of June. Um, <laughs> Um, so in uh, the beginning of May, I want to say, we surpassed 200,000 checklists and 2,000 atlasers. So now we're at almost 2,200 atlasers. Um, and we have now, you know, over 200 species have been confirmed breeding in the state so far. Um, so this is just a really cool way to, to see what's been um, observed and where things have been observed. Um, and on all of these overview pages, you can, you can click on these column headings and sort by them. It's not obvious, but you can sort by these columns. And so here I just sorted by confirmations. And this shows you that like American Robin is the most commonly confirmed species across the state. So um, it's just kind of fun to like look through and, and see what's going on. Um, okay, so the really fun part of atlasing is obviously looking at the birds and looking at their behaviors. Um, and uh, what we've done in New York is we've really tried, um, we've really tried to, to make it easy for people who are new to birding or new to atlasing. We've tried to make it really easy um, for, for you to be able to know what to report in terms of these breeding behaviors. And Angela, yes, I'm getting to um, confirmed in just a sec. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's hard because so many of these elements are intertwined. So I'm, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so if you have been using eBird, there are a number of different types of information that you can add to your checklist. So you can add age and sex, you can add media files, um, and you can add behaviors and comments. Um, and they have a, a standardized list of behaviors that you can choose from. Um, and uh, those behaviors are the same no matter where you are across the globe, right? So no matter where you are, you, you can use those same um, behaviors. Deb, oh my God, I just placed you as the librarian. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? I can. Yes. Oh my Great. God, I'm so sorry. And you just retired yesterday. Okay. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, is anyone else seeing a black screen besides me? I stopped sharing, so you should be seeing <gasps> oh. me now. Okay. okay. And are you guys familiar with the, the, there's in the top right corner of your screen, there's different ways to view people. And I usually have it on the gallery view. And that way you can see everyone at the same time. In case you're not using that. Um, and I will share my screen again in a, in a moment anyways, but, um, but yeah, um, what was I gonna say? Uh, yeah, so so those breeding behaviors are standardized across anyone who's using eBird platform. So even in all of the other states that are currently doing atlases, they're all the same codes that you would be using. Um, and they're pretty self-explanatory for the most part. You know, if you hear a bird singing, you mark it as singing. If you see a bird carrying nesting material, it's carrying nesting material. If you see it um, carrying food, and it's carrying food. <laughs> um, uh, one thing that I think a lot of people trip up in the beginning is, you know, there's a code for feeding young and also for nest with young. So if you see an adult come in and feed a bird a nestling in the nest, um, we would want you to actually use nest with young because it's a stronger code. It's like a stronger evidence that they're actually breeding in that location. Um, and so this gets to the difference, like what confirmed means. So um, of all these different breeding behaviors, um, we have some codes mean possible breeding. And then we have another set of codes that mean probably breeding. And then we have a set of codes that mean confirmed breeding. Um, and it's just a scale that helps tell us how sure we are that those birds are breeding in that location. Um, and so you'll notice in eBird that it's a list and it always goes in a certain order. Um, and, uh, you know, singing, or sorry, actually not singing, habitat, a bird in the appropriate breeding habitat is the, the least, um, the, like the weakest amount of evidence that a bird is breeding. And then nest with young, is the strongest amount of evidence that we can that we have. Um, so that's our that's our scale right there. Um, and so you always want to use the strongest evidence that you have available. Um, but don't fret, right? Like if you aren't exactly sure what um, what code to use, you can always put comments in there. Um, and, and then you can always follow up and ask somebody later um, how you, what you should actually be using. So I just want to share, I'm going to share my screen again. And I want to show you where you can get information on these different breeding codes. Okay. So the eBird website um, is a little bit clunky. It's not necessarily designed for Atlas projects, which have a lot of information available for, for people that are volunteering with the project. 
But what you do is if you're up here in this top menu, if you go to about, this kind of takes you to like a table of contents of everything that we have on the website. Um, and you'll see on the right hand side here, um, I've got the Atlas Essentials and then one, two, and three. So we've got blocks, which we just talked about. Um, and now we're in the breeding section. Um, and then we'll get to the, the data entry in a minute. Um, and so if you click on number two for observed breeding, um, there's all sorts of resources here that help you figure out when to use which code um, and other tips that, that will help you figure out like when you might expect a particular bird to be breeding. Um, it's something that, that can help and eventually you'll probably build up a little bit of an idea in your head, but it takes time. Um, so we put together these re resources for you so you can not necessarily to take in the field, but when you get home, you can be like, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense that I saw that now because they are breeding at this time of year. Um, so right here, there's a, a breeding codes page. Um, and you'll see I've got observed, possible, probable, confirmed. And that just jumps you down to, to all the definitions for everything. Um, so for possible, we've got it's in the appropriate habitat or it's singing. Probable is it's been singing for a week or more in the same place. That means that it's stable, it's on territory. Um, you've got multiple singing birds, you know, seven or more birds singing it's most likely that at least one of those is breeding there locally. Probably all of them are trying, um, but at least one of them is probably gonna be successful. So we have a code for that. Um, and then you get pair, territory, courtship, visiting a probable nest site. So it goes on and on and on all the way to, um, you know, nest with eggs, nest with young at the very top. Um, and then, I also want to show you, so I have some handouts here. There's also some quizzes here that you can, you know, practice with if you're really not sure. Um, but there's also this um, on the right hand page, uh, the sidebar here, there's handbook and materials, and you can get um, all kinds of information from this page. Um, so you'll be able to get all the, the breeding behavior references, the, the timeline, what codes you're most likely to use with each species, um, some of the guides that we've put together. So um, in terms, you know, we've got one for grassland birds, we've got one for nocturnal birds, um, early nestlings, how to identify fledglings. Um, so I've put together a few, a few things like that um, that you can find here. I also have started doing monthly, every month um, I put out a newsletter and I'm focusing and doing a deep dive on a, a single species. Um, and so you can get really detailed information about these different species that I put together. Um, and then I also have information that you can take with you in the field. Um, so, um, you know, if you wanna try to get access to some property, there's landowner letters available for you here uh, and things like that. So, um, so that's, that's basically it. And, and, you know, we ask you to enter breeding codes whenever you see them, you know, even if you're seeing, um, you know, a, a, a chickadee singing in February, you can still enter that as a code. And we will know um, that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's breeding right then, um, but um, we'll filter that out after the fact. Um, what we really want to know is when they're exhibiting these breeding behaviors throughout the entire year. Lynn, go ahead. Um, okay, so what I'm wondering, since I, I just found out about the Atlas activities, um, and I've been working at home, so I have a bunch of stuff from my home feeder area that I did when I wasn't going in through the bird Atlas link. 
if I went back now that I have, now that I'm using the bird atlas link and added stuff like I saw a pair of Orioles feeding babies in if I went back and added that now, would it show up? Yep, it would. Yeah. So um, awesome. okay. this gets into there's there's one thing you would have to, to do. Um, and that gets to the, the third Atlas Essential, which is using the Atlas portal. And so the Atlas portal, um, it's really it's not like that complicated. It just means so if you're entering data online via via ebird.org um you would just make sure you go to this url you would go to ebird.org slash atlas ny and then you would submit your data here um and that's that that will make sure that it goes into the portal if you're using ebird mobile then you will have to set the app settings and i'll show you how to do that in a minute and i'll show you how to do that if you have a checklist already in eberg, you can also go back in time and switch it into the portal. So that's easy to do as well. Awesome. Um, so, awesome. yeah, so. Thank you. Oh, and one other sort of small question. I'm sorry if this is too much detail. Um, if maybe it's just a comment. If I see, uh, I have a nest of Phoebes, I'm pretty sure they just had a cowbird in the nest. What do I, do I just put that in the note that, you know, yes, they were feeding young, but I'm pretty sure it was a cowbird, not a baby Phoebe. That's a great question. Um, uh, <laughs> so actually you would confer, you've confirmed both species. Um, so you have um, the, the Phoebe feeding young or occupied nest or nest with young, whatever stage they're at. Um, and you have cowbird. Um, so okay. you, you would enter the cowbird and you would enter and say, yes, it's um, nest with young if it's occupied still in the nest. nest or something. Okay. Yeah, if it's still in the nest, cool. you nest with young. Um, but yeah, so you would, you would actually confirm both species. Okay. Um, same thing. So. Um, okay, so one important thing to note with eBird, with eBird, you enter, you count all live birds, and that includes nestlings and chicks, okay? So if you have a nest with four chicks in it and an adult, you would enter five birds, okay? But if you have a nest with four eggs in it and one, one adult, you would only enter one bird. Okay, but <laughs> if one of those eggs is a cowbird egg, <laughs> what you would do is you enter zero for cowbird. You would enter a zero count because it's not alive yet, or well, it's not hatched yet. Um, and that will allow you to add a code. And then you can- Well, I'm not examining egg. the nest that closely, but I could only tell yeah. once it got up and- got it's big very, and was like that is not a phoebe <laughs> yeah it's a very specific situation and i do have that in the you know the, the definitions for the breeding codes how to deal with cow birds yeah but yeah i did no, always a, wonder why they had a zero why you could put zero in so now i understand why you can put zero in that uh, makes sense yeah it also um if you're doing a targeted survey like say you're going out just to listen for whippoorwills or for great horned owls and you don't hear anything you can enter zero and then you can add comments like i was specifically looking for this and and i didn't hear it so you can also do it that way and then it's like a a definitive absence like that you it's like it's not there it's not that I didn't overlook it. It's just that it really wasn't there kind of thing. So, so yeah. Um, let me see behaviors before I go into the portal a little bit more behaviors. Am I missing anything? Um, I think I covered everything I wanted to cover with behaviors. Um, let me ask if, if you guys have any questions about behaviors. Have you encountered anything that you didn't know how to code besides the cowbirds? Okay. 
So what I'll say is that there are a number of ways. So if you have a question, like if you see something and you don't understand what it was, um, and I think, you know, when you're just starting out watching behaviors, um, I think the most confusing one is often courtship um, and, and recognizing what a courtship behavior is. Um, because in different species, it can look very, very different. Um, and sometimes it can look like a very aggressive interaction and it's actually a form of courtship. So, so if you see something that you don't know, um, we do have a, a Facebook discussion group, which is very active. Um, and you can, just, you can just search for New York Breeding Bird Atlas on Facebook and you'll, you'll, um, it'll come up. Um, and you can ask your question there if you're on Facebook. Um, if you're not on Facebook, um, you can always find another Atlaser and, and you know, post your questions on listservs and things like that. Um, or you can contact a regional coordinator. So across the state, so I'm the statewide coordinator, um, but then I, there's also a team of, of local coordinators that I work with across the state. Um, so Zach is, was one of those and, and he had to leave because he has like a two-year-old that was needing to get to bed. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, let's see, let me, sh I can show you where to get regional coordinator information on the website. And then I will get to your question, Angela. Sure. Okay, so on the website, whenever, whatever page you're on, on the, the about pages, just, you can always go to Atlas team. Um, and then you'll find everybody who's involved with the Atlas and you can just, you can scroll down to regional coordinators. Um, and we've broken the state up into these six different regions. And so depending on where you are, you can contact that local region. Um, and then someone from that region will get back to you. Um, and so there's, you know, for capital region, if you want to get a hold of Zach, you would just email nybpa3.capital at gmail.com um, and so forth for all the different regions. Um, so that's the easiest way to do it. Um, you can also contact me. Um, and then there's also like a, um, a general Atlas email as well, just nybba3 at gmail.com. Any of those will get to one of us and, and we'll respond. Um, so, so there's always lots of resources should you have any questions. Um, and like I said before, if you're, if you're not sure of something, just add comments um, and that way it'll be easier for you to go back and, and edit it later on if, if you need to. All right, so Angela asked a good question. When counting birds, can you count what you hear only or do you have to see it? Do both, total of everything that you're detecting, right? Um, the thing with um, behaviors, so other than the singing behavior, most of the other behaviors you kind of have to see in order to, to detect them. Um, so that's one of the like major shifts in your birding style. You might be used to just going through and like listening and, and identifying everything as you're walking down a trail. But if you really want to see a behavior, you're going to have to stop and try to find each of those birds and see what they're actually doing. And if they have food in their bill or nest material or something. Um, but yeah, so you, you can count something. Sometimes you'll see something only. You'll only see it and you won't hear it. Um, and that's a bird you actually want to follow because that means it's being secretive, which means it's up to something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are the quiet ones are the ones you really want to look for. Um, but you can still, still count those um, that you add all of them. So the one other confusing thing with the breeding codes is that the eBird interface only allows you to add one code per species per checklist, right? Um, so you might go out and you might see a catbird. So, so catbirds um, have multiple broods throughout the summer. 
And so you might go out and you might see one bird singing, you might see another one that's carrying nesting material or building a nest, and then you might see another one that's feeding young. Um, so you would just go to the list of behaviors and you would select the one furthest down that list, that the one that, that's the most, like the, the strongest evidence of breeding. So you just, you pick that, the one, the best code that you can. That can be a tricky thing in the beginning. Okay, so I, can I ask you, let me see, is Brian, make sure Brian's still here? Yeah, okay. Um, is anybody entering data through the web or are you all using the eBird mobile app? Maybe you can just put in the chat what you're using. Okay, both. Mobile. All right. Um, interesting. And mobile. Okay. So I think so. All of you are at least using mobile sometimes. So let me start with that and let me just try to. Um, I'm actually now I'm going to try to share my phone screen to show you a couple of tricks in um, in the mobile app. Let's see if I can do that. And I do the same thing too. I'll, I'll enter I'll enter it on my phone and then I might edit it later on the web. Um, but if you're entering your observations in the field in the mobile app, um, that is the best way to keep track of what block you are in. So I guess one thing I haven't emphasized really yet is that every checklist you submit, it should be from one block. So you wanna to try to make sure that you're not escaping and crossing a block boundary, right? So that is probably the single hardest thing when it comes to Alicing, or not necessarily hard, but just like the most onerous part of it, I guess. So you have to kind of pay attention all the time where you are located. Um, so let me see if I can share my iPhone now. Hang on. Sorry, I have to enter this information one more time, but it'll be worth it, I promise. Okay, smart. All right. So looks like, yeah, you can see my screen. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over to my eBird app. All right, and then I'm gonna, um, start by showing you first how to set your portal. So I'm using an iPhone. Um, if you're using an Android, it, um, I believe the, the app settings are gonna be in your top left of your screen. On the iPhone, they're in the bottom right. So I'm gonna hit on this more button in the bottom right. Um, and then you're gonna try to find that settings and account information. So 
I'm going to go there. This is where you can change some of your settings, how information displays in the app when you're um, viewing your checklist. If you look on the very bottom, of course, they hit it as far away as they could. It's on the very bottom. It says portal. Um, and you'll notice mine says uh, New York Breeding Bird Atlas. So if you've never used the, the portal before, you'll probably be in this, um, the generic the primary eBird portal. That's kind of the generic one. Um, that's, you can use that anywhere you are in the world. Um, but all kinds of different regions across the world um, and also different projects have their own portals. Um, so if you scroll all the way down, you'll see um, there's a bunch of different eBird, um, breeding bird atlases in here. So you could go Israel, Maine, Maryland, um, you'll go all the way down and you'll see New York breeding bird atlas. So that's what you hit. Um, and that's all you have to do. Then you can just hit go back out. So I'll hit the settings in the top left and I'll hit done. And now um, I'll just go back over to the submit page and that's it. So now any checklist I submit now will be in the Atlas portal. So it's, it's pretty easy. Um, Lynn asks if you go out of state and forget to go back to the general bird portal. Um, no, that's okay. It'll, um, it'll get kicked out and, and be switched over to the general eBird. You're fine. Yeah. The only thing would be like, so if you went to Maine and you were entering Atlas checklist there, um, it wouldn't count for the main atlas because you're not in their portal, right? So, um, okay. So, so now we've entered, um, we've set the portal. So now you start a checklist. Um, and then it's, it's pretty easy if you haven't, I guess you guys have all used mobile. So you already know how to enter observations. So we can hit three common grackles and right lately they've been feeding their young at our feeders so I'll scroll down. Sorry, I jumped really fast there. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to do that. Sorry. <laughs> it's like habit. <laughs> um, all right, so you enter the species and if you click on the species, then you get this detailed page. So again, I'm using iOS. Android, if you are using the latest version of Android and the latest version of eBird, you're going to have a different interface. And we'll talk about that in a second. But if you're using iOS, um, you're going to scroll down to that breeding code section, add breeding code. And this is your list of breeding codes, right? So we've got from the least, like the weakest evidence, and you scroll all the way down, and you've got the strongest evidence on the bottom. So whenever you've got multiple options to choose from, use the one furthest down that list. Um, so let's say I've, I've been having them feeding young in the backyard. Um, so we'll add that code and we'll hit done. All right, so that's, that's pretty easy. Um, if you are using Android and have the latest version of eBird, instead of seeing this, um, this box, you're going to have a series of dots, color coded, purple color coded circles with just a two letter code in them. Is anybody doing that? Does anybody have that option? Yeah. Yeah. So that can be harder when you're just getting started out to know um, what the different codes mean, right? Um, so if you click on that, the info button, um, it will take you to a help page and then there is a learn more thing and it will describe the breeding beho behaviors down here. Eventually, it'll tell you what they mean. Um, so when you're first starting out, it's going to be a little harder. Um, but I promise you, you'll learn those codes pretty quickly. And if you're using iOS, um, 
this is it, it, it's coming to iOS in a couple months as well. So, so the the good thing is that it will. Um, whoops, go back to Ebert now. Um, the good thing is that for those of us who are entering codes all the time, it'll be fewer clicks, so it'll be less time entering codes. The hard thing is if you're just starting out atlasing and don't know what those two letter codes mean. Um, but I, I can tell you, um, so it's, it's different shades of purple. The darker the purple, the more confirmed, sorry, the, the dark, dark purple is confirmed and the light, light purple is, is possible. Um, so they are color coded in terms of possible problem confirmed. Um, all of the two letter codes with two letters um, are the confirmed codes. Um, so there's a few tricks you can use to try to help you there too. Um, it might be easiest just um, to bring a little cheat sheet with you when you're first starting out. Okay. So so that it's it's really that simple. You're just gonna enter, you know, you can click on something and add species. You can add add your breeding codes. You can say black and white was singing and you can add you can add comments here. That's the details. And you can say, you know, was I up in the tree? Um, something like that, right? Um, so that's pretty easy. So here's the trick now. On the top of the screen, it shows you the time that you've been out, how far you've traveled, and then there's also a um, lat long. If you click on the time or travel distance there, so we'll just click on that. Whoops, there you go. It shows you the map of where you are. <laughs> So we're going to zoom out and see this is where I live at the end of a cul-de-sac in overdrive <laughs> and I am right next to a block boundary. So that white line there is a block boundary. So if I zoom out far enough, there we go, you can okay. see Albany. Okay. So it shows you all the, the atlas blocks. So that's the easiest way to know what block you're in. Um, so you can zoom back and zoom back in. You can see, yeah, in my little backyard. So that is the, the best thing about using mobile apps. That's why I highly recommend using it. Um, it works. Even if you don't have cell reception, it'll work as long as you have GPS service, um, as long as you have a GPS signal. So it works in most of the state, just not some of the like steepest valleys or in some of the Adirondacks, right? Um, but other than that, it'll work everywhere. And if you don't have cell service, you may not see, you know, the, the satellite image but what you'll get is um, like a black or a gray screen, but you'll still see your location and the white lines, even though you won't see the trees and the rivers and all that stuff, but you'll still see that, that the line. So you'll still know whether or not you're about to cross a boundary. Um, and if you are about to cross a boundary, then you would just stop your checklist, um, you'd review it, and then you would just start a new one. So that's it. And then it will automatically go um, into your eBird account and it will go in and it will show up on the Atlas website and it'll show up. Um, it takes about an hour for it to show up on the, the Atlas map that I showed you, like where you can search for effort and how many hours people have spent and, and species, like if you want to search for American Robin. Um, it'll show up about an hour later. Um, so it shows up pretty quickly. All right, so before I stop sharing my phone, does anyone have any questions about the, the mobile app?
Great. It sounds like Deb got it switched over. All right. Then I will share my desktop screen again. And um, let me just stop here. Okay. Let me show you one last thing. So just in case, if so, if you make a mistake or you're not paying attention or you just don't want to bother with the block boundaries and you just want to go birding um, and you're in the portal, um, you can, what we would ask you to do is to, to, to move it out of the portal, right? Because that means we can't assign the species that you observe to a single block. So if you're crossing block boundaries, we don't know, oh, is it in this, is that bird in this block or is it in that block? We don't know. Um, so we would want you to either split the checklist up into two, or if you can't do that, then you would just switch it out of the portal. And sometimes, you know, if you're just birding and you just don't want to pay attention, it's just, it's just easier to, to just not bother and just switch it out of the portal. So. Um, let me show you how to switch the portal. All right, so if you go to the website anywhere, um, even if you're in just ebird.org, um, you go to my eBird. Um, and you can go to manage your checklists. You click on whatever checklist you're um, want to change. And so uh, like, actually, let me show you one thing here, a little detail here. Um, these little icons on the right, they tell you a couple of things. So the little people one shows you that that checklist is shared with somebody else. Um, and then this circle within a circle thing that tells you that it is in a different portal. So that's your signal that it's in the Atlas portal. Okay, so if we check, um, we can go to a checklist I did this morning. We'll click on this one. Um, let's say, let's just imagine that I cross block boundaries and I wanted to switch it, switch it to the other portal. So um, in the top right, there's checklist tools. Um, and one of the options here is to change portal. So you would hit change portal um, and then you would select what portal it, whoops, select which portal you wanna change it to. In most cases, it would just be that generic eBird one. So you would just hit generic eBird and then you would hit change portal. And then you would go back to my eBird um, to your checklists. And now that checklist no longer has that portal symbol there. So that means it's out of the check, out of the, the Atlas portal. Um, so that's all you'll have to do. So Lynn, um, that's that's what you would do for, for your past checklists, um, which for most of the ones, if they were in your backyard, um, you were probably stationary, which means you were within a single block. So it should be pretty easy. You could just go through and, and switch them off. Um, so one other thing I want to show you, a lot of people have this question and concern. So if we go back to, into this checklist here, a lot of people get worried about if they see something rare, um, they may not want to publicize it um, because they're afraid other people might go and disturb it. Um, so there is an option for you, I would still enter it into eBird, enter it into the portal. Um, and then what you can do is you can select hide from eBird output, okay? And that means um, it'll, it'll hide it from anybody. Um, it's also hidden from me, <laughs> but I get um, like, so I don't see it either on the, the interface when I'm looking at information, um, but I do get the I do get those observations a, a couple times a year. So it's not like they're totally lost, but um, it just it just makes it harder. Um, so 
anyways, but that is an option. And, and a lot of people do do that for, for things like a grasshopper sparrow or something like that. Um, so let me just go back. I'm going to change this back to my portal. So this was an atlas checklist. Change portal done. Okay. And that's it. Um, what else do I want to show you real quick? So um, if we go back to go here, it's the easiest way for me to direct you to um, actually I'll see. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll tell you the way to go to go through about, go to the about page. And then, so we have um, a YouTube channel and I put together some tutorials for how to um, basically everything I just showed you to set the portal, to enter, enter data, to um, come on, there we go. Um, and to uh, check block boundaries. So if you wanted to see that again, you can always watch it there. Um, and then also um, there's recordings of a lot of the talks that, that we've given over the last couple of years. Um, so if you have anything, um, you know, some free time and wanted to watch something, um, there's some, some, good, some good talks on there. Um, so there's different ways to get to tutorials and things, but so on this about page, um, if you go to the tutorials, facts and links, um, if you go to tutorials, you'll get a link to the Atlas tutorials, um, some of the webinar archives and things like that. So, um, and then also there's, um, a number of other tutorials available for eBird that are put together by by eBird um, that are that are pretty good. Um, and then let me show you one last thing. Um, so if you go to the the links thing here, I have a lot of really useful links on here. So if you're looking for information about different species, um, All About Birds is a great place to go. Um, and then and then I've got a whole list of other of other websites. I've got a list of field guides. Um, and I also have recommendations for apps as well. And actually, I need to update this. Um, just yesterday, uh, Merlin, does everyone use Merlin? If you're not using Merlin, you, you should start using it because they just released sound ID yesterday. So basically, um, you, you can open the Merlin app and you can start sound ID and you press a button and it will take whatever you're listening to in the moment and it will ID it for you in real time and tell you what you're listening to. Um, so it's a great way to, it's, it's fairly accurate. It's, it's pretty accurate. I've been using it. I've been beta testing it for a month or so now. Um, and it's, it's really good. I do recommend it. Um, it's not infallible, um, but it's, it's really good and helpful and will will get you going on in the right direction in order to identify something. Um, so that's a really great tool. Um, they also have the photo ID. So if you get a photo of something and you don't know um, what it is, you can, it, it'll use artificial intelligence and identify the bird in your photo. Um, and then uh, I do also recommend the free Audubon app. So the Audubon app has a little bit more um, natural history information in there, including information about the type of nest and where the nest is and the habitat that the nest is in. 
Um, so that can be really helpful if you're in the field and you're like, ah, oh, red-eyed vireo, is that nesting in like a deciduous tree or conifer? Like, I don't know. Um, so, so that's a really good, um, a good resource that I, I, I use both of those um, constantly in the field. Um, those are the, the two apps I would, I would highly recommend and they're both free. So that's all of the like the essential information that I wanted to, to share with you. Hopefully that wasn't too much and too detailed. Um, it's really pretty simple. It's just paying attention to what block you are in, entering those breeding behaviors that you're seeing and just making sure you're using the, the portal and that's it. Um, we do have lots of events all the time going on. So um, starting tomorrow night, we're kicking off the first ever Big Atlas Weekend. Um, and there's four different states that are participating. Um, and so that's gonna be great fun. That starts at 6 p.m. tomorrow and goes through um, until midnight on Sunday. Um, and then uh, there'll be an award ceremony next week. Um, and then I, through um, August, I will be doing uh, monthly town halls. That's something I do once a month. Um, and it's just open for everyone and just ask any questions you have about anything related to the Atlas. Um, so that's a really good resource for you as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's it. So I'm happy to answer any answer any other questions um, that you have. And I see a couple people have been using BirdNet. Well, I'm curious to know how um, how it compares. I haven't actually used BirdNet because it it wasn't available on iPhone until recently. Um, and uh, so, so I, I hadn't tried it, but um, uh, I do recommend Merlin. And I'd be curious to know. I've heard that it's it's easier because it's you don't have to like take a recording and then clip it and, and have an idea. It's it's real time, so it's it's easier. So. Yeah, um, I used uh, Merlin this last weekend. Um, I uh, heard a woodpecker nest. So I heard the babies inside the cavity and it was like, I'm not sure what it is. And I used the Merlin app and, and it identified them. It said downy woodpecker and I waited and sure enough, downy woodpeckers came back to feed those babies. So. Um, so it's pretty, <laughs> pretty powerful. So uh, come back and let me know how, how you like Merlin, um, those of you that have been using BirdNet. So. Good. All right. Thanks, guys. Happy Alicing.